This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. focuses on loss and regret in relation to absent and exiled father figures. However, near Michel Bashar Boscovich argues that despite Lay's focus on the father figure, her real focus is the mother figure. I quote, « Attends sa vie sur le père, nous éloignerait-elle de sa vraie préoccupation, à savoir la mère. » Mother figures in Lay's works are often depicted as cruel, harsh forces. Ching Salao describes how in Lay's earlier works such as Calomnie, published in 1993, the mother figures are similar to the murderous figure of Medea. I quote, La mère de l'œuvre de Lay est une dévoreuse, une, destruct une destructrice de la vie. This paper will explore the mother figures of two of Lay's more recent works, A l'enfant que j'en ai which I'll refer to as A l'enfant, <coughs> to save a bit of time, and L'un de Fond. We will attempt to delve deeper into the power of maternal influence and to explore why and how maternal influence ex is exerted. Four main thematic areas will be addressed. Firstly, voluntary childness in Alain Fon that is influenced by the narrator's mother figure. Secondly, the notion that the narrators tend to make choices that are influenced by their mother figures. The third section will build on the second by asking why children make choices that are influenced by their mother figures and will explore childhood trauma. The fourth section will explore the ways in which the narrators attempt to negotiate their past traumas and how the narrative forms employed reflect the desire to not only work through trauma, but also to unshrug maternal influence. This paper is part of tentative and potential research that I hope to explore, explore further as part of doctoral study. Thus, I would appreciate any input or comments that you have may, may have concerning the areas explored today. Anne Lafont is a letter from the female narrator to the son she will not have. In this epistolary text, the narrator explains to him why she has chosen not to have children. Childlessness in Alain Fon has been analysed in depth by Natalie Edwards in her work Voicing Voluntary Childlessness, Narratives of Non-Mothering in French. Childlessness itself is, is itself a still a polemic and fraught phenomenon for both women and society. Edwards states the long-standing taboo of voicing voluntary childlessness and how childless women are viewed pejoratively by society. She states, one of the major stereotypes of the voluntary, voluntarily childless is that there is something wrong with them. She adds that childless women are abnormal, insufficiently developed, immature, and suffer from physical, emotional, or mental issues. The narrator of Al Enfant sardonically acknowledges many of the psychoanalytical and societal prejudices against women who choose not to have children through the voice of S. However, the narrator also seems to recognize that she would not make a so-called good mother due to the negative qualities that she sees in herself. She even suggests that she might contaminate her unborn son with her perceived weaknesses. She says, Peut-être t'aurais-je infecté, tu aurais été instable, and que j'ai à transmettre si ce n'est pas mon impuissance à être dans la norme. She views herself as abnormal and has a crippling lack of self-confidence. Her dark, brutalizing self-observations may be founded and her comments merely harsh truths, but it is also true that her mother has shaped the way she perceives herself. The narrator states, Big Mother a détruit le peu d'assurance que j'avais. The narrator describes a traumatic relationship with her mother, which seems to have affected her sense of self and her decision to not have children. Edwards cites the psychoanalytical research of Isabelle Timon and Edith Vallée that shows that a number of childless women name their maternal relationships as the justifications for not becoming mothers themselves. Big Mother influences the narrator's choice to remain childless due to her traumatic and controlling mothering. 
Edwards draws the parallel between the moniker Big Mother and the Orwellian Big Brother. Big Mother is seemingly all-seeing, controlling her daughter's clothes, interests, and activities. Her surveillance of her daughters seems to be founded on themes of visibility, as she insists that they cover their bodies completely with long sleeves and long skirts. The daughters are not allowed to expose any part of their bodies in public, such as at the beach. She controls who sees her daughters, and also the way in which people see her daughters in terms of values and morals. The narrator recites a long list of all activities that are banned for the daughters in Big Mother's attempt to control their behaviour. The narrator uses lists and anaphora, repeating words such as contre, to emphasise all that was denied and forbidden for the daughters. It is interesting to note that the activities that Big Mother forbids and scorns relate to the narrator's future career as a writer. Lecture poetrice are banned, as is writing in a personal diary because it is an incoupable complaisance, and reading poetry because les belles lettres ne sont faites que pour des losers, au propre de la société. In becoming a writer, the narrator also becomes one of Big Mother's so-called losers of society. The narrator assumes that Big Mother would see her children as la maudite race des poètes. The narrator seems to be saving her son from Big Mother's cruelty. From an early age, she decided not to not become a mother pour ne pas donner à mes enfants l'éducation que j'ai reçue. She explains how Big Mother and her controlling style of mothering are some of the factors in her decision to not have children. In the second section, we will explore how mother figures can influence other aspects of their children's lives. Big Mother is an example of the influence of mother figures on their children's adult choices, both personal and professional. In Lame de Fond, the four narrators are negotiating the death of Van, who is also one of the narrators speaking from beyond the grave. His death drives the four narrators to recount their childhood, childhoods and familial relationships thus far. These are all linked to Van's own childhood narrative and death. They are also similar due to the continued influence of their mother figures and of past familial traumas. Lou, Van's wife, grew up with a hostile mother figure similar to Big Mother. She does not defend Lou when her stepbrothers abuse and harass her. Lou says, Ma mère ne voulait rien entendre. Instead, Lou is at fault, her mother describing her as buissance, terrible, je faisais de la provoque que j'avais la grosse tête et un caractère de cochon. This betrayal by her mother and her abusive stepbrothers pushes Lou to become headstrong and the mother-daughter animosity mounts. They become dinner table adversaries as they launch verbal attacks and jives at each other. Lou describes how, entre nous, il n'y avait jamais de cesser le feu. Lou's mother dislikes her and is also completely different to her. Her mother is distinctly bourgeois, snobbish, and racist. She only mixes with those of haute naissance. She proclaims white superiority and cites the moral risks of mixed race, mixed race marriages. In contrast, Lou marries Van, who is of Vietnamese origin. She describes the venomous letter in which her mother exhorts Lou for embarrassing her and for ignoring the education she provided her based on racism and intolerant vitriol. Lou does not explicitly say whether she married Van as a deliberate act in defiance of her mother. However, her mother does view Lou's marriage as such, exclaiming, exclaiming voilà une minute de désobéissance. It is certain that Lou is happy to be rid of her mother, who disinherits her after the marriage to Van. Lou says, je me félicite d'avoir rompu toutes les relations. This self-congratulatory reaction alludes to a more deliberate decision to marry an inappropriate man, in inverted commas, in her mother's eyes. In terms of professional success, Lou's mother lords her stepson's prosperity, their flats and second homes. In contrast, Lou wants to go to the Ecole Normale and become a teacher. But before she commences her studies, her mother showers her with disdain and states that she will only be une petite ainsi. Lou is the opposite of what her mother hoped for her, and is in fact the opposite of her. While it is true that children often naturally bear differences to their parents, it appears that Lou makes decisions to defy her mother and to not succumb to becoming une prétendante prétendante. From an early age, she wants to escape compare her dreams of a better life in Paris. Lou also recognizes her conscious efforts to differentiate herself from her mother. She works at learning how to become compassionate and caring because her upbringing could have suffocated any sensitivity in her if she herself had not completed the leçon d'humanité. Ulma, who is Van's half-sister, similarly experiences feelings of non-belonging and a lack of a stable family unit during her formative years. She is raised alternatively by her single grandmother, Lily, or by her single mother, Justine. 
She does not know her father as he returns to Vietnam and has little to no knowledge of her existence. Like the other daughters in Lay's work, Alma is raised purely with mother figures who come to influence her greatly. Justine is a drug addict who frequently relapses with an unstable, itinerant existence. In contrast, Alma wants to support herself. She quickly finds herself ungainly bad so that she does not have to deal with the reproaches of her mother. Justine criticizes Alma for working in fashion and for being nothing but a baby doll. <laughs> and she criticizes Lily um, her grandmother, for providing Alma with the best clothes, food, and books. However, con in contradiction, Justine relies on the inheritance of Lily, on various lovers and partners, and even on the charity of Alma. Here, mother and daughter are vastly different in terms of working principles and education. Justine, elle, elle n'allait même pas la bac, while Alma says that j'avais toujours soif de menstruer. Lily rewarded Alma with um, good food, books, and trips to the zoo when she achieved good grades. Moreover, her grandmother makes sacrifices so that Ulmer can continue to progress and do well in school. While rewarding Ulmer for good grades may suggest that Ulmer works hard in order to receive more gifts, it can also be argued that Ulmer does well in school in order to experience some form of maternal love since Justine abandons her regularly and criticizes her. Indeed, Ulmer remarks that Jusqu'à mes 15 ans, j'avais pensé que je n'aurais pas dû naître. She feels like a burden to just Justine and sees how she souffrait d'être partout traité en parent pauvre. She feels unwanted by Justine and thus attempts to create a sense of belonging with Lily. Moreover, Lily dies at a young age, relatively young age, leaving Alma without a family unit or sense of belonging. Lily leaves her apartment to Justine in the hope that she will live there as a family unit with Alma, but Justine rejects Alma once again. Alma is forced to deal with the trauma of rejection, lack of family unit, grief, and the presence of a negative mother figure. Lou's mother makes her feel unwanted and unloved, leading to Lou's departure from the family unit to attempt to find her own way. Lor is the exception, Lor is the daughter of Lou and Van, is the exception to the single parent family units described. However, she still becomes the recipient of her parents' mothering and fathering that are inflected by their past familial and maternal traumas, as we will see in the following section. In this third section, we will explore childhood trauma further and the ways that personal trauma can be passed down through generations. Big Mother has already been established as a powerful mother figure who negatively impacts the narrator of Al Enfant. She is one of the reasons behind the narrator's choice to remain childless, and she also implicitly influences other reasons behind this decision, such as lack of confidence, the residual trauma that the narrator has to work through, and the belief that she will not be a good mother. Big Mother can be seen as an archetypal bad mother from Lay's earlier works. It can also be said that while she is cruel and mean, she is also working through her own past trauma. The narrator's grandmother, i.e. Big Mother's mother, is described as having a backward conception of femininity and woman's role. She only has to be hum humble, she does not need to educate herself. Indeed, her grandmother, avait petit de la misogynie, the grandmother's misogynistic and rigid outlook must have affected Big Mother and perhaps to the point of traumatizing her at an early age. Indeed, the narrator mentions how Big Mother was haunted by the prospect of being alone and thus, elle s'était précipitée dans les bras de mon père. For if she did not have a ring on her finger, then elle était plus bonne à rien. This is a heavy burden for a young woman and perhaps explains Big Mother's rancor towards her daughters. They are, are the result of her hasty marriage, one that resulted in her husband leaving her with four daughters to raise. Her controlling surveillance of her daughters, her unyielding rules about appropriate behaviour, and her explicit desire to restrict the visibility of her daughters' bodies all point to her underlying wish to stop her daughters from exposing themselves to men and relationships at a young age like she did. Perhaps she is trying and failing to, to protect her daughters from marrying hastily like she did, she wants to correct her perceived past mistake through her daughters. Justine is similar to Big Mother because she is cruel and also has past trauma. She too has been left by a man to raise a child and, an, and at a young age. She is also still working through her own childhood trauma and her fraught relationship with her mother, Lily. Lily has Justine as a replacement child to her firstborn son who dies at a young age. Her mother, desperate for a son, had chosen the name Justin or Justin, which was altered to Justine for her daughter. Lou describes how Justine used this replacement status as an excuse. Cela excuse toutes ses résignes. 
Ulmer damps Justine's excuse of Park's trauma by bluntly stating, Elle était une jeune fille qui n'assumait pas. She adds that whether Justine had her hit or not, Elle n'avait pas de bon moral. It is true that just Justine is a selfish and unlikable mother figure, but it is possible that she suffered due to her mother's grief and her desire for a son rather than a daughter. Justine suffers further due to seeing Lily, mother Ulma, in a different way to her. She says that Lily is gaga de sa petite fille alors qu'elle n'avait pas été une mère bienveillante. Lou and Van both bring their own familial childhood and maternal trauma to their relationship, and they both mother or parent, in the case of Van, in ways that reflect their pasts and their traumas. Lou does not want to transform into her mother, so she strives for a close relationship with her daughter, Lov. She describes them as déduitistes. She frequently sides with Law against Van, and, then, and she even sets a bad example for Law of une grande intellectuelle in contrast to Van's parenting. Van's mother influences his parenting. She encouraged him to learn and study, particularly the French language and literature. He also encourages his daughter Law to read and do well in school. He copies his mother, potentially due to the fact that she sacrificed for his education and to help him leave Vietnam. She also dies when Van is young. This traumatic loss and exile from his mother arguably leads him to be shaped and influenced by his mother when it comes to him to parent law. From tracing the ripple effects of trauma down through generations and sometimes tracing trauma back through generations, Lay shows the reader that none of the narrators can escape maternal influence in their childhoods. Moreover, most of the bad mother figures can be analyzed in terms of their own mothers, their childhoods, and the various pressures placed on them. It should be noted that attempting to explain away negative maternal figures and their traumatizing mothers is not the goal of this paper. We are also not veering into apologist discourse. There is also a problematic risk of pathologizing trauma through tracing its multifarious effects. This paper instead seeks to expose the repetitive and rippling effect of trauma as it continues down through generations affecting children and grandchildren. Trauma is destined to resurface and to be repeated. It has been theorized through different metaphors and paradigms such as Sigmund Freud's notion of the return of the repressed or to return to the field of contemporary women's writing in French. Catherine Robson's use of the wound metaphor to imagine the perpetual openness of trauma. Repetitions of maternal trauma in Al Enfant and Lame d'Enfant are figured through individuals and how they come to mother their children. Their mothering and attitudes towards their children are shaped and influenced by their past traumas. Thus, to, exert, to a certain extent, their maternal traumas experienced in childhood are repeat, being repeated in subsequent generations, rippling and refracting through various maternal figures. In this fourth and final section, we will see the different ways that the narrators work through trauma and the importance placed on writing. The narrator of An Enfant chooses to remain childless in order to break the cycle of repeated trauma that she perceives as passing down through mother figures. Her partner S criticizes her de, uh, de persister à ne pas me perpetuer. Mothering is thus seen as extending a part of the mother's existence. Indeed, Laure, in the case of Lame Dauphin, Laure accuses Van of wanting her to be his copy, une dévoreuse de livres, when he is in fact parenting her in this way due to his underlying paternal trauma. He wants to copy the way that his mother mothered him. Lou also uses their daughter, Laure, to work through her past maternal traumas. Laure becomes the human site of her parents attempting to assuage their traumas of maternal loss and the negative influence of the cruel mother, respectively. Children thus become opportunities for their parents, and particularly mothers, to assuage and perhaps negate past childhood traumas. However, as we have seen, mother figures have an incredible influence on their children, and past traumas will ripple down through generations if children are used to attempt to right traumatic wrongs. Writing and feeling in the present, rather than looking to the future or to future children, seems to be the way to work through past traumas and to break the continued rippling effect of maternal trauma. And the narrative and forms employed by the various voices belie this desire to work through trauma individually without affecting others. Indeed, Ulma has been working through her trauma by attending therapy, and the form of her narrative is a letter to her former therapist that she will never send. The narrator of Alain Fon writes a letter to her non-existent son, and thus sends it to no one. 
She works through her issues by herself. The epistolary exchange is established purely to allow the narrator to work through the trauma. Van and Lou both write confessions of sorts in La Dauphin to attempt to assuage their feelings of guilt, loss, and grief. Lou writes for herself, and Van is speaking from beyond the grave, thus no one will hear their testimonies. Laure's form is writing in a personal journal, which is obviously for herself and for nobody else. The narrators are writing, in, all, in both texts, the narrators are writing purely for their benefit and not for the eyes or ears of others. At the end of their narratives, particularly in La Vaughan, it is clear that they are attempting to write through their trauma in the present moment and in the present generation. They will continue to work, wade and write through their maternal traumas, which is perhaps a positive step for the narrators, who will no longer simultaneously try to ignore the past while looking to the future and to children as opportunities to assuage their personal trauma.